Hiking the Natural Estate is the theme of our show today. We'll begin on the Buffalo River Trail in historic Boxley Valley in the upper portion of the Buffalo National River. Hiking along that trail takes you to some of the most spectacular views overlooking America's first national river. And then it's on to an area known as the Pedestal Rock Scenic Area near Pelser, where huge rock formations resembling towering pedestals 320 million years in the making offer an ancient glimpse into the geology of the Ozarks. Our final hike takes us to one of the most remote and picturesque areas of the United States, where many folks have referred to as resembling the Garden of Eden. Deep in the Ozark National Forest, the Richland Creek Wilderness Area contains Richland Falls and Twin Falls, which do indeed offer a paradise-type setting. And joining us on that hike will be Arkansas Parks and Tourism photographer Chuck Harrelson, who will offer us some professional waterfall photography tips. So grab your hiking sticks, plop down on the easy chair, and let's begin on the Buffalo River Trail. This serene and picturesque valley near the town of Boxley in northwest Arkansas is referred to as Historic Boxley Valley. We decided to find out just what is so historic about this valley where the Buffalo River Trail begins. Well, there's a tremendous amount of history and it, it ranges everything from prehistoric Indian times through pioneer times to modern day times. Uh, some of the families that live here, they've lived here for generations and generations. These names came here in the 1850s and their you know, descendants are still here today farming and logging and, and doing a lot of the things that, you know, that their descendants did. Uh, this area is really a time capsule of Ozark life. And it's such an isolated area, even though it's close to a lot of places, Northwest Arkansas, Central Arkansas, it's still kind of an isolated area. And uh, that was even uh, the way it was back then in the Civil War times. This area didn't, it just didn't see the impact of the Civil War quite like other areas of the country did. Although there were skirmishes here, and there's actually um, a story that says that the families who lived in the northern end of the valley were actually Union sympathizers, and the families who lived in the southern end were for the south. Hmm. So uh, it eventually made it here. Uh, again, a couple of little skirmishes over Saltpeter Caves. There are a couple of them located uh, near where we're standing right now. They were making gunpowder. Making gunpowder, uh-huh. And, and the gunpowder was actually being made for the Confederates. So the Union Army would come in and uh, do some attacks, and they'd shut them down, but then over a few months, they'd you know, get back at it and they'd be producing saltpeter again. There's not much left of the old homesteads here, such as the Whiteley homestead. Not much left of it. Unfortunately, some arsonists uh, burned that down a few years back, but the Whiteley Edgeman homestead is one of many homesteads that if you're hiking in this area, and even in some cases you can drive up to, uh, you know, when you're out on the Buffalo River Trail, one of the most fascinating things that you can do is come across perhaps an Indian bluff shelter Okay, uh, or uh, remnants of cabins like this, or an actual cabin or old barn itself. I mean, some of these things go back to the, you know, 1850s, the late 1800s, 1920s. There's a barn just upriver of us here that was built back in the 1930s. Just a beautiful time capsule, again, of Ozark Mountain life. Joining us on our hike at the other trailhead of the Buffalo River Trail at Steel Creek near Ponca, along with Rhonda Mills, is photographer Chuck Harrelson with the Arkansas Department of Parks and Tourism, who will give us some photography tips later in the show. The Buffalo River Trail, or BRT, is a relatively new trail, and much of it is still under construction. One of the highlights in taking the trail from the Steel Creek campground is enjoying Steel Creek itself. You'll also have to cross Steel Creek to get up to the first overlook on the trail. Well, Steel Creek was named for George and Nancy Steele, who settled this area around 1848. They raised 11 children down here, Chuck, at the bottom of, 
uh, the bluff where the where Steel Creek comes into the buffalo, nine of which were born and raised right there. So. Um, you know, several people have lived up and down this section of river over the years, but the, the scariest thing that happened was uh, back just before the Park Service established the river as a, a national treasure, uh, there was a, a ranch here actually that had plans to develop a golf course, condominiums, uh, about 250. From, from what I've read, and uh, we would have had an airstrip and a lot of other things going on here that would have turned this entirely, you know, the fabric of this landscape entirely a different direction. So uh, we're real thankful that Wiser Heads prevailed and we were able to salvage uh, this beautiful area and turn it into America's first national river. The Buffalo National River was also the cornerstone for the state's environmental movement. And that's right, because, you know, if you think about uh, the other rivers in Arkansas, the Corps of Engineers, you know, a viable mm -hmm. entity, but at the same time, you know, the White River uh, was already, uh, had been mm -hmm. dammed several times, and, and so the buffalo was just another on the list. So uh, s somehow a, a lot of folks woke up to the reality that, you know, we need to save this because that's what this state is about. I mean, that's why it's the natural state. And, you know, I would argue with anyone that this is one of the most beautiful places in the entire Midwest. And it would have been a shame to see that change. Now, you have an interesting story about uh, the lifestyle here, uh, particularly one individual that you know, and uh, you had asked him about being uh, uh, raised in the area and uh -huh. reared up and... Uh, and his thoughts about that. You gotta share that. Well, we were out here riding together one time and uh, he actually grew up around the corner here down on the river and, and I asked him, I said, you know, and he's, this is a gentleman who's in his late 50s. I said, you know, when you were raised here, did you, did you really comprehend and, and appreciate where you were? And, and he very honestly said, you know, Rondi said, I really don't think we did. What we saw was an opportunity to make a living, and it was a very hard living. You know, he w was raised in a two-room cabin with a family of six, okay? Mm -hmm. And they, they logged, they farmed. And, and as you look out here and, and you see what it's like, I mean, that was a tough way to survive. And, and these are very tough people. Now, what's great is today, he's able to come out and ride his mule and enjoy it. And, and he will say, this is a fabulous place. But when I was being raised and when we were working hard, we didn't really think about the fantastic place that we lived in. On any hike, Rhonda says it's not so much going the distance, but enjoying what's along the way. People have a tendency, and myself included, um, we have a tendency to become very fixated on destination as opposed to things that happen along the way, the little treasures along the mm -hmm. way. And, and if someone is coming here to hike, the best advice I can give them is don't get so focused on how far you're going you know, take time to talk to somebody who's been there, you know, come in, see us. Let's talk about, you know, what you're interested in and what you'd like to see because distance is really not what you're here to do. You're here to see the little home places along the way, the foundations, the chimneys that are standing. Going up Sneed Creek, for example, is a marvel because of all the limestone slides along the way that the little creek follows. And, and so don't get excited so much about how far you're going. Get excited about what you're gonna do on either side along the way. That may only be 10 miles worth of trail, but it'll be an outstanding 10 miles worth of trail. 10 miles is plenty enough for me. <laughs> of course, enjoying a sunset in the Buffalo National River region is a must. The phrase being put on a pedestal takes on quite the literal meaning here at the Pedestal Rocks area near Pelser. Come along with us as we explore the ancient past of the Ozarks on top of the world. The Pedestal Rocks area, 40 miles north of Russellville and 6 miles east of Pelser on Highway 16, really is one of the more awe-inspiring locations in the Ozarks. With rock formations resembling huge pedestals, this area offers a great history lesson in Arkansas geology. 
Hiking the two and a half mile loop trail with us is geologist Scott Osbrooks with the Arkansas Geological Commission. The lines that we see running across here, they tell a story. Yes, Chuck, they are, uh, they're, what we're looking at here is, is layers upon layers of sediment deposited by an ancient river system some 320 million years ago. And what geologists look at, we can, as you can see here, some of these lines are at an angle, what we call cross bedding. And from there, we can tell actually what direction this river was flowing. Hmm. These unique towering rock columns do indeed tell the ancient story of the Ozarks. They do. They tell us uh, what the, uh, the Ozarks were like back some 320 million years ago. You know, today we, th we see, we look out and we see the plateaus and the mountains, but 320 million years ago, this tells us that the, the Ozarks were a uh, plain with a river, a major river system running through it, and that these rocks are a result of the sediments that were deposited by those ancient streams. You know, Scott, looking at this pedestal rock, uh, you wonder how in the world did it ever form like this by itself, but really it wasn't by itself way back when. No, Chuck, what we're looking at here is uh, deposits of uh, sand from a river system some 300 plus million years ago that was deposited into an ocean not too far to, from, to the south of us here. And after its barrel and, uh, and basically solidification uh, into rock, and over time this rock has been exposed and now it's been eroded. And this, actually this pedestal was once a part of the bluff line that we see behind us. And uh, over time with rain and wind, it is simply, it has, and the fractures in the rock has allowed water to move through it and basically enlarged and, and, and give us the rock that we see here today. So this is primarily what, sandstone? That's correct. Hmm. It's a uh, core, fine to medium grain sandstone. It's uh, it, it coarse in some areas and you can also see uh, some of the ripple beds and some of the de deposit features that was the same th uh, things that we see today in, in river, modern river systems. Mm -hmm. We can actually see what was going on some 300 million years ago. And all this green is lichen, and there's yes. like orange lichen too on some of them. You see green, orange, brown. Uh, anywhere the rock is exposed to the wa water, you'll see this lichen growing on it. If you take the time to go down to the base of the bluff line, you'll experience the underworld of pedestal rocks, caves and shelters that also formed as a result of the massive weathering and were once used by early civilizations. Some of the pedestal formations you'll find here are in their infancy. So what we're looking at here, I guess, Scott, is uh, seems to be the beginnings of a, of a pedestal? That's correct. As you look up here, you can see the uh, uh, crack or fracture in the rock, and that allows water from above, rainwater, to come through. And as it hits this uh, uh, weaker rock, it begins to erode and widen out into the cavity we see here. And eventually, over time, this will separate from the bluff behind me. And, and eventually you're going to end up, over time, is what you get over here, this freestanding pedestal that we see all around this area. It'll take a few years. It's going to take many years. <laughs> So explore for yourself the Pedestal Rocks area near Pelser and venture into the unknown. It's 11,800 acres of pristine beauty, waterfalls, bluffs, 
clear mountain streams and rugged terrain, the Richland Creek Wilderness Area deep in the Ozark National Forest. Join us for a hike to Richland Falls and Twin Falls, the closest thing to the Garden of Eden. The Richland Creek Wilderness Area, without a doubt, is one of the most scenic places in the entire United States. Getting to this extremely remote area is not exactly easy. Any way you look at it, you're going to have to drive a few miles on a county road or two. Richland Falls and Twin Falls are located about two and a half miles upstream from the Richland Creek Campground. There is a primitive yeah. trail that parallels the stream, which Let's means there are loose there. rocks, <laughs> slippery spots, and depending on the time of the year, poison ivy. If it's your first time taking the hike, it would probably be a good idea to take some topographical maps or a guide from the area. We took Jay Harrod and photographer Chuck Harrelson with the Department of Parks and Tourism. I've got to really watch my step right here. This is a uh, real nice leg breaker right here. This little crevice down here. Sometimes when I'm shooting, I get so involved in what I'm doing, I forget where I am. I know one day, I almost walked into traffic, just slapped into traffic because I was so worried about what I was doing, I forgot where I was. So this is a little leg breaker right there. For more than a quarter of a century, Chuck Harrelson has been photographing the natural state from every angle possible for all those fantastic and awesome pictures you see in the travel brochures. Sun's cooperating with me and staying in. The only way I like to shoot waterfalls is on a cloudy day. Just too bright with the sun out. Really close. At Richland Falls, we talked with Chuck about how to get that certain unique angle and about photographing waterfalls like the pros. Well, you know, when I'm hiking to waterfalls and sometimes I'll get to places and people are already there shooting pictures, well, the number one mistake people make, they don't have a tripod. Mm -hmm. If you don't have a tripod, you can't have the, the slow shutter speeds to make the water silk like that. So I always shoot with a slow shutter speed, maybe one to two seconds, a real fine grain, uh, slow film, like a 50 ASA Fujichrome or something like that. And I like a, a, a polarizing filter that really knocks the light down even more and it takes the sparkle off of the water also. And the combination of all three or four of those things, you can really get that silky look like that. And the only days that I shoot a waterfall is on a cloudy day. Like today's a real marginal day because the sun's coming in and out. So the only time I can shoot is when the sun goes in. And it's really still kind of bright today, but I'm just making the best of it today. And you always look for that other angle. Like you said, you can always shoot it below, but up here, uh, you know, situated where we are, it is, a, like you said, a very right. different angle. Yeah. When we walked up here, the majority of the people, amateurs, would walk up, they would shoot their pictures here, soak their feet in the water, and walk back, you know. When I do my photography, I want to do something that, I want to do a picture that someone looks at and goes, how did he do that? Where was he standing to get that shot? That's what I want people to think that when I do my stuff. You know, I don't want people to say, that's yes, okay shot, you know. How did a guy get that shot? So that's what I always look for, something different and difficult to do. Nice thing about these digitals, you can see what you've got as soon as you shoot it. I shoot a whole lot less since I went to digital. We've all heard the phrase having an eye for photography, and according to Chuck, there is a lot of merit to that. Well, it's almost scary nowadays with digital cameras what people can do. You never know what you're really seeing with digital photography. You don't know whether they really took that picture or whether they did it in Photoshop. But I do think there are people that have eyes. I think, personally, myself, I was blessed with an eye. I think that was one of the few things I was blessed with was to be able to see. It's so easy for me to see pictures. It's so easy. It's not even work anymore. It's just a pleasure. But yes, I think people, some people are born with an eye. I think, I think the thing with photography, they have to learn the craft. They have to learn the techniques, and that's the hard part for me but uh, and I think and I think you can be taught to see things better if you're 
aware of what's going on, but I think, I think the good photographers are really born with that eye. They really do. From Richland Falls, we now had our sights on Twin Falls. They're probably a quarter mile down here, um, probably a 20 to 25 foot drop off both the falls, mm -hmm. but you have to have really a lot of rain for it to really come down. But it is one of my favorite waterfalls along with Doug Hollow, uh, the Cossatot Falls, um, Falling Waterfalls just up the road here. That's a real nice one. Uh, there are just so many waterfalls in Arkansas. We are so lucky to live in a state that we have abundant water like we do. After forging the creek a second time, we were on our way to Twin Falls. During this type of hike, it's very important to pay close attention to details, not only to watch out for snakes, but also for other wildlife. And not just wildlife, but plant life as well. A mushroom, for instance, unlike any other we've ever seen. After about a 30 minute or so hike from Richland Falls, we finally came to one of the most spectacular waterfalls in the state. Twin Falls is where Long Devil's Fork and Big Devil's Fork converge with side-by-side -side waterfalls of 20 to 25 feet. This site is just too awesome to put into words, so we'll let the video speak for itself. So explore for yourself Twin Falls and Richland Falls at Richland Creek Wilderness Area near Whit Spring, or the Buffalo River Trail, which when completed, will extend almost the entire length of the Buffalo River and provide a link between Arkansas's Ozark Highlands Trail and Missouri's Ozark Trail, forming a system of trails more than 1,000 miles long. And we'll see you again the next time for another exciting adventure on Exploring Arkansas.